People Management Association of the Philippines.
People Management Association of the Philippines. Facing the rapid spread of the COVID-19 pandemic, national and local leaders have taken unprecedented measures to protect these communities, such as placing residents under ECQ, closing businesses and schools, restricting travel and banning large gatherings. These interventions are having wide ranging effects on the health, economy, social, mental and emotional well-being of populations. As communities move towards recovery, policymakers face difficult questions about how and when to relax interventions and how to weigh the economic costs of prolonged mitigation measures against the risk of a second wave of the virus. The adoption of numerous social distancing policies to slow down and ultimately contain the rapid spread of the virus since March have been helping in buying us time. However, without aggressive mass testing yet, and as the Philippine government considers lifting ECQ, how will this affect the flattening of the curve? Good morning. I am Jocelyn Reyes-Pick, the President and Managing Director of Profiles Asia Pacific, Inc. And I will be your moderator for today's webinar. Lo and behold, data analysis on COVID-19 pandemic is hosted by the People Management Association of the Philippines, or PIMA. As we are physically distant due to the imposed enhanced quarantine, we are seeing each other in the digital world. On that note, in case of technical difficulties, please bear with us. For the past weeks, we've had a series of webinars with a total of about 18,500 Zoom re registrants. And we've had a weekly reach of 536,000 people and 147,000 YouTube live views. Since many of you signed up for this webinar, the Zoom application can only accommodate 500 participants. Nevertheless, you may still watch us via PMAP's Facebook page. And if you cannot access the Zoom link, please go to YouTube and hit the subscribe button. You can type People Management Association of the Philippines or search for at PMAP1956. In case you have questions, you may send it to us using the Zoom chat box. Or for those watching us on Facebook, please post your questions in the comment section. Kindly note that the presentation materials are one of the perks of being a PMAP member. For PMAP members who wish to have a copy of the slides and for non-members who wish to be a member of PMAP, kindly send an email to reya.paragsa at pmap.org.ph. I will now be introducing the panelists and the guests. To join me in this PMAP webinar session, I am delighted to introduce our speaker for today. He is a PhD holder and a graduate of the Australian National University, a member of the UP COVID-19 pandemic response team, and one UP and COV modeling subgroup, and concurrently an association, an associate professor of the UP College of Statistics. Let us welcome Professor Peter Julian Caton. Thank you very Hello, much for... you're welcome, Doc Caton. 
Along with him is the current Security Bank Corporation's Assistant Vice President and Chief Economist, who has an extensive exposure in the fields of research, economics, and data analytics from government, academia, consulting, and the private sector. He did stints as an economist and research lead in the Senate, and more recently as a data scientist in the IT and insurance industry. Let us give a virtual clap to Mr. Robert Dan Roses. Good afternoon. Good morning. Sorry. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Joining, uh, joining them is a Filipino sportsman and politician. He is the acknowledged business, uh, business uh, development manager of the boxing icon, Manny Pacquiao, and concurrently our chairperson of the House of Representatives Committee on Labor and Employment. As committee chair, he ensures the rights and welfare of our workers, that they are upheld, and at the same time, without undermining the contribution of the employer's sector. As a senior vice chairman of the House Committee on Overseas Worker Affairs, he also takes an active role to advance the welfare of our kababayans abroad. Let us welcome the Honorable Enrico Eric Pineda. Joining the rest of the group also is the former vice president and head of HRD of Manila Electric Company and former executive director of its Meralco Management and Leadership Development Center, then known as MMLDC, now known as the First Pacific Leadership Academy with a total of 31 years of experience. He is currently the executive director of the Civil Service Institute Civil Service Commission. Let's give a virtual clap to the 2012 Pima past president, Arthur's, Arthur Luis Florentine. We'll have about 45 minutes of presentation from Dr. Caton, followed by about an hour of comments and reactions from our panelists, and then a 15 minute Q&A with our speakers. And I will end this webinar by summarizing the key points that were discussed in this morning's session. So may I hear now from uh, Professor Peter Julian Caton as he talks about data analysis on COVID-19 pandemic. Let's give him a warm clap and a virtual applause. Thank you very much for Mom, uh, Jocelyn Bick. Uh, welcome, Dean Poke. Uh, welcome and good morning to Mr. Robert Dan Rosas. Uh, welcome and good morning, Dean Poke, Sir Luis Rock Florentine, and to our Honorable Eric Mineta of the House of Representatives, and to you all, listeners and webinar participants. So let's uh, start talking about the data, statistics, and the insights we have had in the UP COVID-19 pandemic response team with respect to the current pandemic situation in the country. Let me just share my screen for a moment. Okay, just uh, full screen this for a moment. So I am from the UP COVID-19 pandemic response teams in uh, the subgroup 1UP NCAL modeling. Uh, and I'm also the associate professor at the School of Statistics at the University of the Philippines, Diliman. So what are we trying to do today is to talk about the UP COVID-19 pandemic response team. I will also be talking about another group of which we are giving the results to UP COVID-19 pandemic response team as well, the leads for, for HSR. I'll also talk about the data sources, the statistics, and the insights that we have. With regards to the statistics, here are some of the statistics that we talk about. And in the insights, I'll try to uh, share some ideas that we've had in the UB COVID-19 pandemic response team on certain issues and uh, on the question of the flattening of the curve as well, and also the current state of the Philippines and some major cities and territories as of the data of May 11. So about the UV COVID-19 pandemic response team, our leaders in the group are Dr. Teodoro Herbosa, 
the Executive Vice President of the UP System and Dr. Alfredo Mahar Lagmai, the Executive Director of the UP Resilience Institute. We are about 100 plus experts and volunteers for the whole university from Baguio to Davao. And almost every day we talk to each other, exchanging ideas, uh, looking at certain uh, angles about the COVID-19. And uh, we span multiple fields. We have political scientists, statisticians, mathematicians, geographers, geologists, medical doctors, linguists, economists, and so on. So we're a, a large group of volunteers and experts from the UP COVID-19, from, from the UP system. So right now, one of the projects that we're doing for the uh, COVID-19 pandemic response team is we are uh, publishing monitoring statistics, policy notes, dashboards, briefers, and we also have the Yanni, the messenger bot that interacts with the users of our platform, which is at ncom.ph. You can contact us for a lot more uh, questions about what we're doing at upri.covid19 at up.edu.ph. Now with the leads for HSR, it's really the leading evidence based actions for data science for health security and resilience. And we are made up by a team of data scientists, physicians, mathematicians, and epidemiologists convened by the Philippine Society of Public Health Physicians. With our website currently linked to COVID-19, but in the future we'll be moving away from COVID-19, hopefully by at the end of the epidemic. Now currently one of our projects is the time varying R dashboard, of which I'm uh, leading the team in that regard, and we are displaying the dashboard in the ncom.ph website as well. And we also have the co-informed risk dashboard by Dr. Michael Romintilia and Dr. Jomar Rupahante. Dr. Jomar Rupahante is with me in the uh, UP COVID-19 pandemic response team. Now, with regards to our data sources, we have two main data sources that we look at, and those would be the DOH data drop, which the website is available there. You can also look at it at the DOH website. Uh, the, data, uh, the data drop contains these four main uh, data sets with their corresponding uh, metadata or information about the variable that's there. And we have the case information, which is patient level data. Uh, we also have testing aggregates aggregated by testing laboratories. We also have the weekly report on supplies and the daily report on hospital capacity. Most of the results that I'll be talking about today are based on the case information data set of the DOH data drop. We also look at LTU data, and more recently, one of our products is the dot map of the number of, confer of the confirmed cases in NCR. But how we, do, how we do that is by skimming through the Facebook pages of the confirmed, recovered, and dead uh, statistics coming from the LTUs of NCR. Right now, we do have an ongoing uh, data source from ncal.ph slash quick count with the support from the DIA LTUs for memoranda, but it takes a while for a lot of the LTUs to get into encoding the data. I am monitoring it, plus with other experts in the UP COVID-19 pandemic response team in terms of the, uh, the amount of the uh, percent of municipal municipalities complying. But right now I can say that about half of the municipalities are complying Though there are municipalities that are more frequent, and we'll see what we can do with the data of those who are uh, encoding more frequently. Now, in that uh, quick count uh, website, these are the kinds of data sets that uh, the kind of data that we ask from LDUs confirmed cases, exposed, suspected, probable, recovered, tested individuals, deaths, the reporter, so that we can uh, assess the provenance of the data with the source of the data. Uh, remarks, uh, it's very important for us to read the remarks because sometimes there might have been certain uh, notes that the, uh, that the encoder would give us to adjust the data accordingly. And the location data points, the province, city, and barangay. Now, some of the statistics that we are ta uh, that we are uh, computing in the UP COVID-19 pandemic response team are first the time varying reproduction number, also known as the RT. The RT, time varying reproduction number, it's similar to the analysis of the basic reproduction number. How is it the same in a way? It is uh, summarizing the 
number of the average number of individuals infected by a sick person. So that's what the basic reproduction number is. And the RT is the more time varying or the more time adapting statistic of it. For example, if the R of a patient is he, uh, if the R of an epidemic, because this is an epidemic specific characteristic, the R equals two, which is common for COVID-19, it means that for one person infected with COVID-19, they can transmit the disease to two more other uh, individuals or persons. So that's what the R means, the R0 and the RT would be the time varying aspect of it. RT in a way is how many expected number of new infections, those newly transmitted disease, uh, the, those who would be newly transmitted with the disease, based on how we've seen the infections in the past and how infectious those past persons who were infected uh, as uh, estimated or recorded. So in this sense, how do we analyze the RT? The RT greater than one, it means that the disease transmission is still happening in the community. There are still more getting the disease, more people transmitting the disease in the community. But if RT is less than or equal to one, so that one is our goal or threshold, it means that the transmission is declining in frequency. And in these cases, sometimes this is an indication that the curve is starting flat and a peak of infections might be reached. The statistical approach, I will not discuss it any further, but that is by Corey et al. 2013. I will not discuss the statistical jargon on how it's derived or in any sort of the case, but the analysis, how we do it, how we analyze the RT, that is important. Now, with regards to some examples, I'll discuss the national level RT reproduction number in a later time. But this is what we see, for example. Now in this one is our Philippines, Singapore, and South Korea RT comparison. And as you can see with South Korea, they're able to maintain their RT to be relatively low, lower than one. But this is as of May 5. There have been reports recently that South Korea has a super spreader event. However, with regards to how we see the history of South Korea able to um, mitigate their super spreader events, because they've had a lot in the past, because of their aggressive policy of contact tracing, testing, and isolating cases, they've maintained it to lower levels almost in the full duration of the epidemic. Singapore has had a lot of cases of uh, super spreader events, infection clusters suddenly springing up. But as of May 5, they're able to mitigate it for uh, by lowering, uh, by doing their own aspect of how South Korea is doing it as well. But there have been reports recently again from Singapore with uh, infection clusters coming up again. So again, this might not be too updated in regards to the May 5. This one is from Davao City. And this one is from May 4. I'll later on show you the most recent RT for Davao because I will analyze for the webinar the situation in Davao as well. But this is available at the ncov.ph slash epidemic curves. I'll, I'll show you how I analyze these later. The other one that we are solving in the UP COVID-19 pandemic response team is what we call the outbreak threshold. Now the outbreak threshold in simplest terms, this is how many infected individuals can start an outbreak in an area with a certain chance. So the certain probability that these numbers of infected individuals can start an outbreak in a location. One example of how we analyze this is, for example, if you have R0 equal to two, which is like COVID-19, there's a 90% chance that 3.322 infected persons, so about three or four, may start an outbreak in a population that is well mixing. So in these situations, uh, if you have already three or four infected persons, there's now 90% chance that an outbreak might occur in that area, given that a disease has an R0 equals to two. Now, the well mixing assumption is a very difficult assumption for the Philippines 
because the Philippines is known to be geographically fragmented with different subpopulations having different mixing dynamics. So our country is made out of archipelagos, so it's geographically, geographically fragmented and different islands have different concentrations of people. So different dynamics on how the disease might spread in a specific province or a specific municipality. So an adjustment is proposed by Hartfield and Allison, which accounts for the dispersion parameter of secondary infections. And we've been able to adapt this dispersion parameter to work with the population density dynamics of the country. We use population density to account to the potential of a disease like COVID-19 to spread to the population of concern. Now, once we've solved the threshold, we compute this ratio of active cases, which is confirmed minus recovered over deaths, divided by the estimated threshold. And we use this ratio to make recommendations in terms of what would be the suggested uh, quarantine policy, because this ratio has an associated probability of outbreak. And in this case, these are how we would have uh, recommended based on the threshold. If the ratio is less than 0.7, we don't really suggest community quarantine, but there has to be these other interventions like information campaigns, strengthening the healthcare system, physical distancing, testing and contact tracing, and so on. If the ratio is between 0.7 and 1, that is where we suggest the GCQ, if the ratio is between one and two, ECQ, and R greater than or equal to two, we suggest a more stricter ECQ in this aspect. And those ratios have their corresponding probability of outbreak. This is the most recent result for the province level as of May 10. And as you can see here, uh, the dark blue is the stricter form of ECQ. The blue in the middle uh, gradient would be for the ECQ, and the light blue would be for GCQ. Uh, for some pointers, we kind of suggest that Camarina Sur be on GCQ. The dark blue, which spans from Benguet to Quezon Province, would be for a stricter form of ECQ. Cebu in a stricter form of ECQ, Zamboanga, and Davao del Sur. And then for the municipal city level, Zamboanga City, Davao, much of the region three, region four A, and Manila, Metro Manila, would be suggested for the stricter form of ECQ. We do have an interactive map available in the ncom.ph slash map, which could be accessed online. Another statistic that we have is the case fatality ratio of uh, case fatality rate, which is generally the ratio of deaths over those who have healed or died. And this is our measure of disease severity. Now, we're, what we're using in the UPN call, UPN call uh, pandemic response team would be the uh, adjustment to hospitalization to death. Because I've said earlier, it's the ratio of deaths over those who have healed or died, but there are still some active cases involved. So this is the adjustment for uh, estimating what could be those who may die out of those who are active cases that are still in hospitals. So this is like a forward looking case fatality rate estimate. Now the recovery rate here, it's a very crude one. It's just cumulative recoveries over cumulative number of infected cases. Another thing that we also do in the UB COVID-19 pandemic response team is to plot percent changes. And also more recently, there have been an interest from the IATF to analyze the doubling time. So we also have the implied doubling rate for either recovered or died or confirmed cases as well. Now, I still have a good amount of time so I can talk about the current state of the Philippines on COVID-19 as of May 11th. 
Uh, I do have more recent data for May 12, but to uh, prepare for this, I'm just going to do for May 11. Now, based on the current state of the Philippines in terms of RT, uh, as you can see, here is the historical plot of RT for the Philippines. RT is again the transmission of the disease by infected individuals. So before May 15, uh, before March 15, we've kind of estimated that for the Philippines, we've had a very high RT, about three to four. And this means that in the beginning, it seems that uh, for every individual who has COVID-19, they may infect three to four individuals. And that is a very alarming rate, especially for the country. But after May, 5th, March 15, there has been this uh, fluctuation around two. And then around April 7, that's the first time that the R has dropped to below one. And here are what our explanations in that would be. Well, in the uh, March 15th, it, is, it was known that COVID-19 has an incubation period of 10 to 14 days. And welcome, uh, Congressman Enrico Pineda. Uh, so we've had, we already know that COVID-19 is an incubation uh, period of about 14, 10 to 14 days. And there have been reports that DOH tends to have a delay on releasing the tests by about a week. So add 14 and seven, you have 21 days. And if you look at March 15 plus 21, there is a chance that you will get to April 7. So this is how we think that the uh, lockdown or the community quarantine has had some effect in decreasing the transmissions. However, we do caution that this analysis only depends with regards to the tested, confirmed, uh, symptomatic cases. We do not know or we, we have a, we do not have a full idea of how the asymptomatics of COVID-19 might be behaving, though we do believe that hopefully they are. Uh, complying with the uh, community quarantine, hopefully, and therefore not being able to infect others. Now, with regards to the current value, the current value as of May 11 is 0.9261685. That is less than one, so there's, there, there is absolutely a decline in the transmission of COVID-19 in the country at large. And the 95% credible interval does not contain one. So there's sufficient evidence to say that there is declining transmission. But as you'll notice in the history of the Philippines from April 7 up to today, it has been fluctuating up and down one. And in these cases, it might be like a little bump in an increase in cases, we might report that there is transmission of COVID-19 still. So we are in this lull period of up and down, dancing around the number one, which is a crucial number when looking at the RT. Now, here are the graphs for the cumulative confirmed and remaining cases and cumulative recoveries and deaths in the Philippines. Now, cumulative confirmed cases will always be going up. However, it's a great way to compare them with the cumulative active cases that we have for the Philippines because it is best to see that the active cases are distancing away from the confirmed cases. Because what we're saying there is the active cases, the cases still remaining in the country with COVID-19 are getting removed out of COVID-19. But when we say removed, it might be that we need recoveries or deaths. So the lower graph of recoveries and deaths are still important so that we can see the context of how are we, uh, how are we in terms of uh, healing those who have COVID-19. And more recently, we have a higher level of recoveries over deaths. In the past, we have had deaths higher than recoveries, and that has been a 
larger problem, but more recently, we've gained the ability to heal more than uh, heal more for our COVID-19 patients. Right now, there are only 75.42% of confirmed cases that are active. So one out of four have recovered or died, and three out of four are still active cases for the whole country. Uh, later on, you will see that this is not going to be the situation for all regions, for all territories of the country, but this is looking at the country at large. Now, for the Philippines, the case fatality rate is, it started very high, 100%, because we only have one case that died. And then it has started to decline. And right now, I am confident to say that it's stable around the 6.5 to 7% case fatality rate. The CFR of the Philippines is around 6.63%. This is adjusted to hospitalization to death. So forward looking in terms of those who are still active cases that we estimate what proportion of them might uh, be dying. Uh, for those who have lost loved ones, uh, may their love may, may those uh, have died from the disease may have rest for their souls. Now, let's have with the crude recovery rate for the Philippines. Uh, it started pretty high because two out of three of those who were the first three cases were uh, recovered and got back home to their home countries because they were imported cases. And then once we had the local transmission, it has decreased because we're still having this adjustment into the recoveries. But more recently, it is in an upward trend starting around April, and now the recovery rate for the country is 18.03%. Now, this is the implied doubling time for the Philippines. And as you can see, this is estimated from the percent change. And I kind of like this statistic because it tells you, it's, it's like your uh, speedometer in the car. So this is telling you how fast are we doubling. And the more that we double in terms of the confirmed cases, it means that it takes a long while for the confirmed cases to grow. So right now, as you can see, around the end of April to the beginning of May, we've had doubling rates around 25 to 30 days. But this is implied based on the percent change. Okay, so more recently, our confirmed cases have been doubling at a rate of about 25 to 30 days. You can check it out. For example, right now we have 11,350 track back when we re we have reached half of that value and more likely than not that would be about 20 to 30 days ago so that's what this implied doubling time really means now with recoveries it's uh it's not a good setting for us for recoveries to be slowing down to be doubling time for the doubling time to be larger, but this is relatively lower compared to deaths or the confirmed cases doubling time. Death is doubling from, uh, much more longer, and that is a good thing. Now, let me talk about the major cities and territories for NCR. NCR is right now in the inconclusive zone in terms of the COVID-19 transmission. Uh, it is absolutely less than one with 0.9832, but the credible interval contains one, which means that there is this still possibility that there's increased transmission or declining transmission. It is inconclusive. So we are in this gray area of what is the underlying level of transmission in NCR. Now, 
this is one good thing that I am seeing with regards to the active cases. It is starting to flatten. This is not the flattening of the curve per se, but in here, what we're doing, what we're seeing is a slowdown of the active cases. It means that more cases tend to be getting out of the disease than staying into the disease. Yes, the confirmed cases will be increasing. That is going to be that way. But with regards to active cases, if this starts going down, that is a good thing. And why is it going down? Well, we can see here that the recoveries are accelerating. And that is a good news in terms of the recoveries that we are seeing. Deaths are still at the positive trend. But again, good news with regards to recoveries. But with respect to transmission, we're still in this gray area. Now, with the case fatality rate uh, and the recovery rate, it is still an incline in Metro, in Metro Manila. The case fatality rate is positive, has a positive trend. And right now it's at 7.46, which is about a point, and a point higher than the national average. Recovery rates are better in Metro Manila at 20.13, which is two points higher than the national average, as you can see here. In NCR, the doubling rate is slower. It's around, third, uh, it's around about 40 days to double, meaning the doubling rate of those cases in Metro Manila right now is around 40 days. And you can check this out by, for example, at the most recent counts of NCR cases, check out when do you find the half of that in the past. And that would be around 30 to 40 days. For recoveries, it's, it's now around the seven to 30 day doubling time. For deaths, it's a little bit above 30 days doubling time recently. For Cebu City, uh, this one is a very interesting one because this case where there was an extremely high amount of uh, new cases because our RT is dependent on the reported confirmed cases. We can improve the RT if we had access to the onset of symptoms data, which is with DOH, but DOH only restricts access to that data. So right now, these RT values, these are based on the reported confirmed new cases. And there was a time in April, April 17 or 16, in which there was a very high number of cases after a period of no cases in Cebu City. And then some of the spikes are related to certain incidents, certain cases in Cebu City where large barangays have been discovered as infection clusters. So right now, however, in Cebu City uh, for May 11, there is sufficient evidence to say that the transmission is declining, but that is just the result based on observed new cases right now. I might just hastily go through the other cases here. So right now with Cebu City, there are at least a thousand cases 1,200, 1,300, but the recoveries and deaths are relatively low. This is based on the data coming from the DOH. Uh, there is a lag time between the data from the LGUs to the data of DOH. We are trying our best to source from the LGUs as soon as possible with regards to the quick count that I said earlier. The outbreak threshold of Cebu City is 2.58. Uh, this is estimated from the larger provincial threshold of the Cebu province, an allocation for Cebu City, 2.58. Now, 
how many confirmed cases are still active based on the DOH? It's still a large fraction, 97.93. There is one situation that Cebu is improving on, and that is in their case fatality rate of 0.66. This is 10 times lower than the national average of 6.6 .6, as you recall earlier however there is still a there is still a low recovery rate as based on the doh data because the recovery rate is about 1.43 so there's still a large amount of active cases in cebu city right now there have been as you can see these extreme uh, values of doubling time now, doubling time being high is good, but this might be just those very small instances of reporting. However, based on our assessment in terms of the doubling time, the doubling time in Cebu City is typically around close to seven, a little bit above or below seven with respect to Cebu City's case doubling time. Now, it is very hard to analyze recoveries and deaths in Cebu City because it has been only changing in slow increments. If you can recall, parang it's just up a little bit, then it stays the same, up a little bit, and it stays the same. So it's very hard to analyze the uh, Cebu City uh, doubling rates for recoveries and deaths. So now let's move to Davao City. In Davao, Right now, it's again in the inconclusive territory because it is possible that the true value is less than one or greater than one. We are simply estimating here. But based on the estimate on its own, 1.0806, there is a positive transmission of COVID-19, an increasing transmission of COVID-19. But because we're estimating, the true value might be between 0.7 to 1.5, okay? So it's inconclusive still with the Vow City. However, one good thing about Davao City is that its active cases have been relatively lower than their confirmed cases. About 34.21% of confirmed cases are active. Most of those cases are, most of the confirmed cases are recoveries over deaths. Uh, if you take out those active cases. So most of those who are out of the disease are recoveries and deaths. The outbreak threshold for Davao City is about 11.06. So if there are 11.06 infected individuals in Davao City still remaining, there is a 90% chance that the disease could still spread through the city in an outbreak scenario. So in the history of Davao City, there have been very high case fatality rates. It's just more recently, starting April 20, that the recovery rates have increased to about half. Every person in Davao City that gets infected with COVID-19 recovers half of the time. But this, again, we can only conclude based on those symptomatic cases. CFR for Davao City is still relatively higher than the national value of 6.63. Right now, the case fatality rate in Davao City is 12.5%, but it is in a declining scenario since April 16. Uh, the doubling time in Davao City, there have been these ups and downs in terms of its doubling time, but we can say that it juggles around the 30-day doubling time. Recoveries are a mixed bag. You can see it's around the seven to three, seven to 30 day doubling time. But you see a lot of these blank points is because of 0% change. Again, if you look at Davao City data for the recoveries, there have been these breaks of suddenly flat and then going up suddenly flat and going up. So that's where those uh, floating dots come from, those periods of no change to suddenly change. So it's very difficult to analyze doubling times in these scenarios. 
times. But right now, with regards to doubling time in Davao City, if there are changes, it's between 7 to 30 days doubling time. Now, for more of the RT and epidemic curves, we have them available at ncov.ph slash epidemic curves. The outbreak threshold and number of active cases, they are available at ncov.ph slash map. And every day I write the compendia of COVID-19 statistics for the Philippines, volume one regions and provinces and volume two cities and municipalities. And the regions and provinces is about 700 pages, but you can just choose which region you want from the big file, from the larger file. And volume two is about 2,800 pages, but you can just choose which city or municipality to look at from that compendium. You can email us at upri.covid19 at up.edu.ph for more on that. Are we flattening the curve? One insight that we will talk about, and I will share with you the position of the UP COVID-19 pandemic response team. Now, how do we say that we flatten the curve? Now, there are two prevailing descriptions of such. One description that is popular to the public is that the new cases has declined significantly or close to zero or in a very low value. However, in its original description of what flattening the curve is, you have to compare it to a curve of new cases if there were no interventions. So you have to compare it, no interventions versus with interventions. And that is what you see in this graphic here. So if there were no interventions, this could have been the number of new cases per day. But because of interventions, there have been this curve of the uh, new cases. That is the original definition. And why are we doing this? So that we can have our healthcare system be able to uh, be able to handle the number of cases coming into the country. Now, for the COVID-19 pandemic response team, we kind of estimated that at peak there could be 80,000 if there were no interventions. So that is, that 80,000 includes those without symptoms and those uh, that are not necessarily tested to be positive from COVID-19. Now, With regards to the ECQ having been for a very long while, now there's been, there's been this common graph shown in social media, which is this one coming from andcoronavirus.org. And this is the ECQ curve that we have. Now, it some say that this is not an evidence for the curve because we are highlighted as needing more action. And I agree, we do need more action for the Philippines. But to answer the question of, are we flattening the curve? We have to compare it with a reference curve, a curve where there is no intervention. And what you're seeing here is the lower purple line. And that is, that is in the same aspect as what you're seeing with this ECQ curve. So around March 15, there has been an intervention and then it is having a lower number of cases. So indeed, uh, we're not uh, we're not going above 1,000 per day, which is a pretty good thing. Note that there is a possibility if there were no interventions that there would be 80,000 in a day, which is pretty bad. So in a way, there is some flattening of the curve. And why are we doing this flattening of the curve? So that our healthcare sector could handle the number of new cases. Now, are we just going to be looking at the flattening of the curve to be our hurrah, our success story? Not necessarily. There are still cases, there are still possible transmissions of COVID-19 in the population. There are still 
case fatalities, there are still people that are that we have to care for to recover. But this is something that we've achieved in terms of uh, letting our healthcare sector adapt and hopefully our government to have more time to prepare ourselves to uh, easy, to prepare ourselves to opening up a little bit by improving on our testing infrastructure, which is still a room for development for the country. Now, we cannot just open up uh, suddenly. We have to be smart in opening up. We have to have the necessary infrastructure so that we can prevent a second wave or for some people in the UP COVID-19 response team, it might be just a rebound or resurgence because we're what we're doing with the ECQ is we may have just been delaying the peak. And that is one factor that quarantines are doing. They are trying the best to delay the peak so that we can prepare our infrastructure, our healthcare infrastructure, our testing infrastructure, and so on. Yes, we have to be wary of the resurgence and rebound. And we have to be intelligent into opening up after community quarantine. And we still have to be uh, careful as a public in terms of social distancing, wearing protective gear like face masks and so on. And we have to base it on the science. That is why we're generating a lot of these statistics because we want to base our decisions in science. Now, let's talk about some new normal ideas. First is on transportation. We have simulations on bus and train car segments. And generally the idea here is we should social distance in buses and train car segments, at least one meter. There should be no interactions between passengers as much as possible. And wearing a face mask in public transport can create protection. Now, these are just preliminary ideas. I'm trying to hasten a little bit because I might be eating too much time for, for talking here. But we will open more details in future public uh, policy notes. In fact, the transportation might be the next one soon. But that is all. Uh, with regards to the simulations that are accessible in YouTube, you can just uh, look. Uh, these simulations were created by Alvin Buhat of UPLB. In the workplace, uh, there is a calculator designed by Dr. Jomar Rabahante. It's still in beta testing. You can give comments to his risk calculator and job risk assessment. And it's available in the Data Studio Google website is shown in the slide, but there are four, four things to consider with respect to the considerations in the workplace. One, the number of interactions per hour, because the more interactions, the more likely to transmit COVID-19. The duration of work, which is in compounding with the number of interactions per hour, the longer you work, given the other factors as well, the more likely that you may be exposed to COVID-19. Crowd density is the third one. And again, it's important because density is a factor in spreading the disease. And number four, the level of personal protection, because the more protected you are, the less likely that you will get COVID-19. Now, those four are things to consider, but you also have to consider the building wide, because we know offices Yes, you already have a policy in your office, but once you go out of your office, use the toilet or use the elevator, now you can be still infected in those environments. So there should have this building-wide or again, community or this building-wide approach in which you have to look at the sanitation policies in shared or public places like toilet rooms, elevators, cafeterias, lounges, and so on, reception desks as well. So you must shared in public spaces, you also have to consider uh, in that aspect. So you cannot just focus on a very local 
approach to handling the workplace, like you're off the office only. You also have to look at shared spaces as well. What should be the policies in this aspect? Now, with the workplace, it is best that digital transformation in workflow processes and transactions be implemented. We have to now accept digital forms, digital transactions in this aspect. Now, as much as possible, the team recommends work from home if they can. Essential workers, if they have to work in their areas, they should be provided with protection equipment. And again, as you've seen with most of the results and the idea with COVID-19 is we, want, we have to reduce physical interactions as much as possible. We have to do in manners in which we would reduce it. I know it's a very hard investment and COVID-19 suddenly pushes everyone to do digital transformation. Even for me, I'm adjusting as a teacher. Uh, how do I handle my students? So how do I conduct classes from here on in? So those are some difficulties, but we have to adapt uh, in this aspect. So in summary, now major cities, they may be improving, but there are still too many cases. Note that yes, it seems that we are flattening the curve in its original description, but it is not the only goal. We should be able to ramp up our infrastructure, especially on testing, contact tracing, and isolating cases, and also with respect to our healthcare sector. As much as possible, stay at home, except for survival needs. And as much as possible, we have to consider reducing physical interactions until we are able to resolve the disease by a vaccine or a very powerful treatment. Here are my sources. Thank you very much. Maraming salamat po. Let's give a virtual clap for Professor Julian Caton. Very informative uh, discussion indeed. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, those who may wish to have a copy of the presentation can please email Pima. Now, uh, I also mentioned that we're going to have three other uh, panelists who will be reacting and presenting their own views about, uh, about the discussion this morning. So may I please call on Mr. Dan Roses to give his reaction and his comments. Hi, uh, good morning everyone. No? Um, thank you, Dr. Uh, Kayton, uh, for that very uh, comprehensive presentation. I surely learned a lot. No? Sorry, I had to turn off my, my video no? because my uh, internet connection is lagging. No? So, uh, But can you hear me well, Ms. Jocelyn Peek? Yes, I can. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So good morning, um, fellow panelists. Um, uh, yeah, of course, Madam Peek. Um, PP uh, Turok, uh, Dr. Kayton, of course, and Honorable uh, Congressman Pineda. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, good morning, PMAPers. Okay. So by way of uh, reaction, I'll have a very short presentation no? uh, in terms of the macroeconomic impact of COVID-19, uh, such as what we are experiencing right now, and um, why, how, or how this ties up to uh, what we are uh, what Dr. Caton uh, uh, earlier presented. Okay, so uh, yeah. So next slide, please. Thank you. All right. So by way of context, no. Uh, uh, what we will be, what what you will be seeing later on, um, is uh, provided by the baseline that the IMF already has uh, done. No. So the IMF um, is calling this the Great Lockdown. No? So what is the Great Lockdown? Um, you may have heard of in the 90s and late 90s, you had the Asian financial crisis. Um, in uh, 2008, that was the Great Recession. So right now, what we are uh, uh, experiencing is something that they labeled the Great Lockdown. No? So what IMF sees is uh, the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression of the 1930s. Um, we're in for a global uh, contraction of negative 3%. So that's uh, the latest projection so far 
by the IMF. Next slide. Okay, so by way of uh, uh, context as well, um, we've been seeing this headline inflation rates going down or even uh, in the midst of the pandemic. So why do we have low price growth? Well, primarily because of the um, uh, low uh, oil prices that we have globally. So uh, crude's worldwide demand remains subdued because you know uh, all um, economic activity has uh, slowed no, or has essentially stopped. So that's why we're seeing very low oil prices worldwide. No, and we are seeing that. No, in the Philippines, can say what matters when we look at price growth. You have yes. the food basket. You have you have the oil prices. No, so um, even if if the food basket uh, is uh, essentially going up, uh, we're still experiencing some very low price growth because of the oil uh, component. No, so low oil prices is taking the pressure off of Philippine inflation, which is actually very good for us because we are a net importer of oil. Okay, next slide. So uh, yeah, so relative to inflation or price growth, um, we we are projecting a very benign inflation environment in the coming uh, months, no, or until the end of the year. Um, BSP has uh, essentially cut uh, interest rates. It's now at the policy rate is now at two point seventy five percent because. Uh, they have enough fighting room no, because of a very benign inflation environment. Okay, next slide. So this is our uh, scenario for, uh, uh, for the GDP. Full year 2020 GDP right now will average around um, a negative 4%. No? So uh, please notice it's still an evolving view. No? Uh, we were quite surprised by the first quarter uh, number at negative 0.2%. Um, and then all the calculations move. No? So what we're seeing is probably a deeper contraction by the second quarter of negative 9% growth. Okay. So what drives uh, the GDP or the growth? No? Uh, well, it's household consumption. So if household consumption is tempered uh, and consumption is around 73% of uh, Philippine growth, um, cons uh, consumption is tempered because we are in ECQ. You know? So we, we can't go out, we can spend. Businesses who normally offer uh, goods to us have closed down. So uh, consumption is tempered and that's why uh, growth also contracted. Next slide, please. Okay, so these are just the components uh, of household final consumption expenditure based on the 2019 GDP. No? So what, what do people consume when we say consumption? Most of it, uh, nearly half of it is food and non-alcoholic beverages, okay? So those uh, with, the, with the stars or the asterisks in the first column are, are uh, consumptions, consumption uh, items that we think will contract in 2020 because of the lockdown. Okay. Next slide. And relative to that, um, we have here a list of um, industries that, are, that will be sensitive after uh, the lifting of the ECQ. No? So the red sectors, uh, this will be the industries or sectors, sectors that will take much longer to recover. Uh, and they've been hit hardest because of capital expenditure shrinkage and uncertainty of expansion. No? So first and foremost, there's tourism. Uh, tourism is the hardest hit industry, followed by construction. Uh, you have real estate activities. Uh, in fact, we see residential office demand uh, to soften or the valuation to soft, soften for the rest of the year and probably just only turn around by next year. No? Those in the pink, those are uh, may experience a gradual recovery. Uh, and, and in the green, these are the sectors that, that is expected to recover faster or have been ECQ proof. No? So these are the sectors that will be affected after the ECQ is lifted. Next slide. Okay. So what do we think, uh, what is our projection for uh, the pandemic's effect to unemployment? So um, we could probably see record unemployment levels for the rest of the year with the spike beginning at Q2 um, as workers and OFWs remain displaced now. So the government recent, recently uh, uh, reported that there's uh, around 1.2 million displaced workers already 
uh, because of the lockdowns. So, uh, but this, by the start of the year, we already had around 2 million, 2.5 million unemployed. So, if you add that in, we'll probably see a surge by the second quarter of around 8%. No? And also, adding to that is uh, the number of displaced OFWs. Uh, that will also put pressure uh, to the labor market. No? And also, with reported CapEx reductions of most establishments and limited operations, uh, displaced workers will probably be reabsorbed very slowly. So uh, if, that's even if some activities return. So uh, the high unemployment rates will probably be persistent for the rest of the year. Okay. Next slide. Okay, so uh, we'll probably also see a remittance slowdown because of the pandemic. Uh, we see a negative 12% year-on-year contraction. Uh, so that means uh, if the final level of... Uh, uh, remittance uh, in 2019 was around 30 billion US dollars we can probably expect only around 6.4 billion dollars to be remitted uh, for this year no? so that's a negative 12 percent uh, year and year contraction um, if you look at the graph on on top no? um, you see there the Asian financial crisis and the great recession uh, normally remittances have tended to remain relatively steady no? even in those past crises um, it's really resilient. No? But this uh, event right now is very different. Why? Because um, uh, it has hit the hospitality and cruise industries very badly, and also cargo ships. And as you know, uh, we have a lot of seamen deployed there. No? So that's, uh, uh, that's where the cratering uh, in, in the second quarter and the third quarter might probably happen. No? So uh, we could probably see a contraction of uh, remittances from those uh, uh, sea-based uh, deployments. No? So the global recession will hurt the sea-based deployments the most because of our exposure to the cruise industries and cargo shipping uh, uh, industries, which remain at a standstill, standstill with global trade and tourism uh, all but uh, halted. Okay, next slide. Okay, so this is just quarterly forecast of uh, where the PHP will be. Next slide, we can, we can skip that. Okay, so in summary, uh, unlike uh, the past downturns where, the, where these were financial crisis, no? uh, it creeped into consumption. What we have now is a consumption downturn because we have a pandemic and ECQ that spilled into business. No? So this is both an economic and public health crisis, as the NEDA said. No? Hence, it's really important for us to heed correct and accurate predictive models of this pandemic. So uh, what we see, uh, what we saw from Professor Caton's presentation earlier uh, will prove very useful. No? And uh, I can attest that um, um, we in the bank also uh, consult those numbers provided by UP uh, very closely because uh, it's the only uh, source of information that has been proven to be very accurate and also uh, uh, has been proven to be consistent over time. No? So you, you, you will tend to see a lot, a lot of uh, uh, analysis re with regards to flattening the curve and whatnot uh, uh, from all foras and all uh, and different kinds of social media. No? So it's best to consult just one source. No? So that will be uh, very important as well. So uh, and what we keep on saying, no, that, that's why, why um, I, I, uh, why I presented an economic response to what Professor Caton um, presented was because GDP per capita is very important to us. Now, we were one of the fastest growing uh, economies uh, worldwide, no? and now we're back at zero. No? So what we want to do is to improve the GDP per capita. Now, how can that be if the per capita part is die, dead or dying? No? So GDP per capita is the uh, productivity of each person in the economy. So, um, so that's why it's very important for us to heed what uh, the models are telling us. No? So the real realization is that more and more, we need to be able to govern with data, to expedite decision making, and mitigate risks in the new economy. No? Um, I don't like using the term new normal. No? Um, uh, I'd rather follow what the BSP calls it now, which is now the new economy. No? Uh, and we'll be, we'll be experiencing some very big disruptions moving forward after this 
pandemic no uh, so that will uh, uh, probably sum up uh, why uh, the correct term will be the new economy no? so uh, I'm, I'm still uh, uh, wondering why we haven't been managing uh, with data more and more no we, well but if if any uh, good thing has come out of this is that uh, that capability has probably been expedited no? uh, in terms of decision making. Uh, next slide. Okay, so this is just uh, a summary of our evolving macroeconomic forecast. No? So uh, if I may, um, we have to commend our BSP, our NEDA, and our DOF who have been doing commendable policy actions no, uh, to manage this downturn. Um, everybody or, or most, can I say, almost all economies will be contracting uh, starting the second quarter and for the rest of the year. No. So it's not just us, but we have very good economic managers who will, uh, I'm sure will manage us uh, and, and, and uh, ensure a very soft landing when we hit the bottom. No. So we will be taking off and we will be recovering faster than the rest uh, with this, uh, yeah, from this pandemic, okay. Uh, so I think this ends my reaction. Good, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Robert Dan Roses for your very uh, insightful uh, analysis of the economic implications of uh, this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and I look forward to the new economy, as you're saying. Now I'd like to welcome Kong Eric Beneda. He's going to talk about, uh, he will react on the implications to policymaking, especially to employment, labor, and matters that affect people as far as labor and employment is concerned. So, uh, Kong uh, Eric Pineda. Good morning, Paul. Good morning. Uh, the, uh, before anything else, what we have done in Congress was uh, the speaker set up two committees, uh, mostly comprised of chairmen of different uh, committees too. And uh, one is the social amelioration program. And the other one is the economic stimulus. And uh, I am both members of those two committees. Uh, we have the crafted and drafted uh, bills that will uh, help all our uh, highly impacted uh, industries, the workers. And, but before anything else, uh, let me just ask, I'm sorry, I have a frozen shoulder today. And it's quite painful. That's why I was not able to report for work. Yeah. But as I will just ask first my chief of staff, C. Jelena, to read uh, the briefer that we have prepared for this uh, webinar. Jelena? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Kong Eric. Um, so before I proceed, I'll, I would like to share the efforts done by our government for the welfare of our workers. The Department of Labor and Employment, or DOLE, initially requested for 7.8 billion pesos from the IATF for assistance to workers affected by the enhanced community quarantine. However, only 4.2 billion was released to the agency. DOLE launched the COVID-19 Adjustment Measure Program, or CAMP, and received at least a million applications coming from workers from the formal sector, specifically from the micro, small, and medium enterprises. The agency extended one, a one-time 5,000 peso assistance to three, uh, 633,000 workers from 31,000 MSMEs. DOLE also implemented the ACAP program where it offered $200 or 10,000 pesos of one-time cash assistance to displaced workers on site and those repatriated or stranded in the country due to community quarantine. So these are the um, overseas Filipino workers. As per Dolly's latest report, at least 103,000 OFWs or 74% of their actual target 
has already been processed. However, with the global impact of the pandemic, the dollar is still processing a total of 368,000 more OFWs who were affected. That is as of March, as of May 5. In relation to the informal sector, dollar disbursed at least 1.3 billion pesos to implement the TUPAD program, a work for cash program where worker beneficiaries receive minimum wage for a specific time period. Currently, the dollar has already exhausted all the funds allotted to them. The agency already made the request for an, an additional 5 billion pesos, given the influx of applications for the CAMP and ACAP program, where the application period was already terminated on April 15. While the request is still under deliberations by the IATF, the Department of Finance, in partnership with the Social Security System and the Bureau of Internal Revenue launched a small business wage subsidy program and allotted at least 51 billion, which shall provide aid to at least 115,000 workers of small businesses affected by the work stoppage due to the pandemic. Almost 50% of the beneficiaries have already received the cash aid in the first week of May. The said program aims to provide a monthly wage subsidy of 5,000 to 8,000 depending on the minimum wage levels in the respective regions each for two months to around 3.4 million eligible employees of small businesses affected by the uh, quarantine measures imposed nationwide. Now, on the matter of labor policies adapting the new normal, Congress is already deliberating on an economic stimulus package to jumpstart our economy. As provided by the data analysis of Pro Professor Caton, the government policies need to adjust to the new normal and we need to provide um, necessary action to jumpstart our economy. While it is still a work in progress, with regard to deliberations and consolidation of the numerous proposals coming from all committees of Congress that covers basically all sectors, um, we will share some highlights that have been adopted with concern to labor and employment. As stated in the proposed economic stimulus bill, DOLE will be offering wage subsidies to critically impacted businesses, amounting to at least 25%, but not more than 75% of actual payroll costs for two months for purpose of employment retention, provided that those shall receive the maximum wage subsidy should include those directly impacted by the COVID-19, such as tourism, air transportation, trade industries, and those that support the priority programs of the government, such as the Build, Build, Build. The agency is likewise mandated to provide amelioration directly to freelancers and self-employed uh, persons through an open application window system. The amount of wage amelioration shall not be more than 75% of their wages, wherein maximum wages shall not exceed 20,000 pesos per month. And this shall be only for a maximum of two months. For OFWs, a maximum of 15,000 pesos a month for two months. An amount, an amount of 130 billion pesos is proposed to um, fund this wage subsidy program. And there is another 20 billion pesos that is proposed to be allocated for an enhanced TUPAD program, which is the work for cash program. On the other hand, regularizations of MSMEs is proposed to ensure that enterprises in the informal sectors may be included. The BIR and Department of Trade and Industry is given the authority to relax the regulations for the purpose of inclusivity. The DTI is mandated to provide grants for education, training, and counseling of MSMEs on improving business resiliency in the post-COVID-19 era. 10 billion pesos is proposed to be allotted for this undertaking. On the matter of bridging loans of MSMEs, the proposed economic stimulus bill allocates 25 billion pesos for this year and another 30 billion for, 2020, for 2021. 
the said amount shall be used to provide additional capitals to some SMM, MSMEs, including startup enterprises. An additional 50, 50 billion, I, I mean, the additional is 50 billion for 2021. And for, um, we will be, the government will be offering zero interest loans for MSMEs in the amount of 50 billion pesos for 2020 and another 50 billion for 2021. This will be implemented by the Land Bank of the Philippines and the Development Bank of the Philippines. We should take note that MSMEs and their labor, labor force are connected in a lot of ways. The very reason that policies concerning MSMEs that comprise a big percentage of the employer sector should be corresponding to the concerns also of the labor sector. For our OFWs, it is recommended that they should improve their skills through our government capability and skills development programs. In a way, as policymakers, it is uh, it's high time that we already transform our OFWs into entrepreneurs given the opportunities and funding that the government shall provide once the economic stimulus bill is finalized and enacted. It is important to take note that the proposed bill, in the proposed bill, startup enterprises in the micro level shall be given preference in terms of assistance. And as we know, when the community quarantine is lifted, it's still recommended that employers and the labor sector follow guidelines in their health and safety. The health and safety policies in the workplace is already provided in RA 11058 or the OSHA law. That being said, physical or social distancing shall be the new norm in the workplace. Workplaces should be sanitized regularly and other measures ensuring the prevention of the transmission of the virus should be strictly observed. It is a responsibility that lies not only with the employers but also with the workers as well. Further, we should maximize the present technologies and make necessary innovations to adjust to the new normal. Work from, the work from home setup, which was once um, impossible and was not used before, is now being adopted by many companies. So this is an option that the employer sector may explore further. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... Kong Eric for that wonderful briefer and uh, Miss Jelena for reading it for him. We certainly hope that uh, you'll, you'll feel better with your, with your cold so, uh, shoulder. I know it can get to be very painful, but uh, that's a lot of good news. What uh, you as chairman of the Labor and Employment Committee at Congress is, is doing to help almost everybody from the MSMEs to the SMEs to the displaced workers and uh, the government being so generous in shelling out its money. And let uh, me say that uh, you know we can the government can only do so much. Our resource resources resources are not uh, unlimited. Yes. And uh, absolutely. For me, what is important is for everyone to adapt, from the businessmen to the employees, because these are different times right now. And mm -hmm. if you will note. If let's say the uh, whole of Metro Manila will go under GCQ, the biggest problem here is transportation, because uh, eighty or more, almost ninety percent of our workers are dependent on the mass transport system. But what is allowed right now, if you will use a tricycle, only one passenger, instead of five before, the jeepney instead of twenty, I think it's a maximum of eight, including the driver. Uh, for buses, I think it's a maximum of 15 to 20. For the uh, MRT, which used to, when they make their normal run, uh, one train setup can handle about 1,000 passengers. Now it's limited to 153. So these are the, the, the biggest uh, stumbling blocks that we have and how we can adapt. Of course, there's a lot of business that will, they have to close shop. Yeah. Unfortunately, it Unfortunately, will happen. Yeah. But it doesn't mean when they close shop that they will just stop. People should not think of other ways and means to earn money. 
and likewise uh, for our workers that will be displaced. You know, that's why we have a uh, an assumption here that a lot of our uh, citizens that are now residing in Metro Manila will migrate back to their home provinces because there's going to be a, uh, not much work uh, available in Metro Manila until until such time that uh, there will be a uh, uh, working or a vaccine that can really uh, make the workplace much safer. But until the, this vaccine is available, then all of us will have to adapt. That's what they did in Pakistan. In Pakistan, although the uh, incident is still going up, they opened it up. The, they opened up the lockdown because the reasoning is this. The poor people cannot afford anymore not to work because it's either they work or they, they die from starvation. So it's, it's a very hard choice for all countries, especially developing countries like the Philippines, that uh, it's, it's a hard choice that we have to look into that uh, if we open up uh, the lockdown and uh, go from uh, ECQ to GCQ, then we will expect you know, that there will be a spike in the number of uh, infected uh, people and likewise the number of deaths. But that would also mean that all these infected, well, the the uh, the statistics shows that about 93% uh, recovers. So most of these people that would recover will now have what they call the uh, antibody. So for them, unless it can be proven again, or somebody from the scientific community can say that if you if you got the virus that you will not be reinfected. But in case you get reinfected, uh, the, the good part is you have the antibodies already and your body knows already how to combat the coronavirus in case you get infected. But like I said, these are, you know, worst case scenarios that we really have to look into. I mean, uh, yesterday we were discussing about the uh, the supply of our staple food, uh, most especially rice. So these are the things that we have to really consider and look into because other countries like Vietnam, they have already stopped exporting and they're now hoarding. The other big producers like Thailand and in, in India are selling most of their supplies to China because China is now hoarding. And China is paying much, much higher than what is the global uh, standard uh, price per metric ton for rice. So these are the things that we have to look into. That's why it's very important for the Department of Agriculture, Agriculture to step up and uh, increase the, uh, the production of our local farmers for rice, which they say is pegged now at 87%. So there's 13% that we still import, but I, I uh, I think that's a very optimistic. I would look at about 20% of our rice is being imported. So these are the things that the government should address immediately so that there will be uh, less waste state. We will have more production and we don't have to be reliant on other countries for our importation. Uh, other importations like, you know, livestock, you know, these are the things that we have to look into because uh, we have to go back to basics now. Eh? But, um maybe you mga uh, business in the you know, businesses in the luxury sector you know they may tempt to, to look at other uh form of business but other than that as i always said we just have to adapt and i think the filipinos are very good at it because we don't give up unlike the other countries that are not used to uh encountering uh problems on a day-to-day -day basis like uh, maybe the United States or the European countries. But here in the Philippines, you know, we have been through a lot and our people are very resilient and they're finding ways and means uh, to uh, make a living despite the uh, danger of, you know, contracting the disease. But like I said, you know, the good part is 97, 93% 
of those that contracts the virus uh, survive. Uh, unfortunately, there's still that six, per, six to seven percent. But you know, these are the things that we have to look into right now. How we can adapt, especially the other businesses. You know, in terms of uh, bringing people to their workplace. Uh, as you can see, some of the uh, flagship projects are already starting. The uh, MRT Seven in uh, Commonwealth. You can see that start, they, they they have workers there already, but I know they are. Uh, being uh, bunkered within the uh, workplace. But that's good because now we have people that are now working and productive and they don't have to rely on government support anymore. And this is what we want to see. And what we want to see from PMAP is for them to look for ways and means to uh, adapt to this uh, situation until such time that we can uh, uh, rely on a very uh, uh, safe and reliable vaccine. But in the absence of such, or in the absence of a, a cure for this pandemic, uh, we just have to adapt and think of other ways for our businesses to survive or even to prosper. But uh, as I know that uh, a lot of businesses right now that are prospering are in the online business. A lot of restaurants are now into uh, delivery and pickup and so forth and so on. So I mean to say everybody's adapting. But we're talking of now the uh, most of the uh, workers that belong to the uh, micro, small, and medium, because uh, like in the micro, there's about about one million registered businesses, but there are about four point five million that we consider as informal. Uh, so these are the businesses that uh, we would really want to address and to help because they need the capital to start up the businesses again. And this is what we're doing right now to make the, 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 cap, the, the funding uh, available and make it easy for them to apply. Ang pinag-usapan nga natin po dito sa mga micro, small, and medium, uh, the presentation of the business permit is more than enough. Once they, uh, they show their business permit to the uh, uh, lending banks, uh, they will be... Uh, they will be uh, entertained immediately. Wala na kong kailangan pila pa na kung ano-ano pa mga form dyan. Basta importante lang po, alam po natin, kaya ka nagbabayad ng business plan mo dahil yung negosyo mo ay maganda, kumikita. So pag nakita po ng mga lending banks that you have this business permit, yun lang po ang kailangan natin. Yun ang pinaglalaban natin para wala na kong masyado tayong red tape. So sa akin lang po, uh, I would like to thank the... Uh, uh, PIMA for this webinar and for us to share, you know, our concerns uh, regarding this pandemic. But as I would like to emphasize again, we should uh, really try to adapt to a situation. It, it's very difficult, but I think we can manage. And, you know, this is what we call the Bayanihan. The Bayanihan talaga, the Bayanihan spirit of the Filipino. Na if, I, ang pakiusap ko lang, you know, for all the other LGUs, if there are these workers that will be displaced in Metro Manila, and who will decide to go back to their home provinces, is for them to accept these people. Kasi kababayan din naman nila ito eh. Kaprobinsa po nila. At uh, pagka nangyari po yan, I, we also see that, you know, a lot of uh, manufacturing concerns or businesses or plants they, they will probably have to shift into different areas and not concentrate within the metro or mega manila alone so ito po mangyayari po dito talaga na sana po eh ma-develop na po tong inaantay nating gamot at yung ating inaantay pong vaccine so that everything will go back to normal sabi nga ni pangulong Duterte pag na-develop na yung vaccine bukas tanggal na lahat ng lockdown but until such time that wala pa huto because hindi naman po natin pwedeng sabihin na O sige, eh, buksan na natin itong lockdown, matira-matibay, di ba? Uh, let's get everyone infected and whoever survives, then we'll, we'll start uh, all over again. That's not the way kasi walang halaga po ang buhay. Napaka sa atin po, hindi po natin pwede pagpalit ang buhay talaga. Pero kaya ginagawa po natin lahat ng paraan uh, na kung sakali magbubukas po tayong lahat, uli, eh, our workers will be safe. That's the first and foremost uh, concern 
of the uh, Committee on Labor and Employment that uh, everyone sa, sa working area sila uh, will be safe. And yun lang, pakiusap lang natin sa mga workers natin that they should also follow the protocol. Whatever the protocol has been uh, uh, developed, uh, that's not for us, it's for them. Para pagka nagtrabaho po sila ulit, yung chances po na they will contract the virus is very, very minimal. So yun lang po. Maraming salamat po sa Primat and more power to you. Mabuhay po tayong lahat. At sana po ituloy po natin itong bayanayin na to. At uh, sa akin po eh, kaya tuloy-tuloy po ang aking padala po ng mga tulong kung saan saan lugar po sa probinsya. Kasi yun na lang po ang tanging pwede natin gawin. Sa dami po na naghihingi po ng tulong, hindi po natin pwede ipikit yung ating bata o ating, sa ating mga tenga sa daing po ng ating mga kababayan na talaga pong naghihirap. Kaya sa akin po, lahat po ng aking magagawa, sa aking may tutulong, talagang ginagawa ko na po ito, out of pocket na po lahat to. Pero sa akin po, ay ako po ay masaya na nakakatulong po ako in my own small way and I would like to enjoin everyone, especially the big businesses, to do their own too. I'm sure that you know a lot have been doing, but let's do some more. Let's help some more until we can uh, defeat this virus. Maraming salamat po. Maraming salamat din po, Kong Eric. At uh, I'm glad that you mentioned that, you know, the resources of government are, are limited. And therefore, there's a need to have uh, a very strong public-private partnership. And we and PMAP can assure you, Congressman, sir, that we will actually work towards the new normal, helping our workers, our workforce, our employers to adapt, risk, be reskilled, learn to cope. And I should say, the key word here is really learning to adapt. And we Filipinos are like bamboos. We are very <laughs> resilient. We know how to sway. We bend. We don't Tama. break. We don't break. So, I, I, yes, Paul. Tapo, guy ng America, eh. Hello? Yes. Yung mga ibang bansa po, gaya po ng America, hindi po sila sanay-sanay itong sitwasyon. Tayo po, kahit nasabihin yung ganito na po, eh. Hindi naman po tayo, we are not resorting into uh, chaos. In, I mean, in countries like the U.S., okay. in a uh, time, you know, everybody will uh, resort to, you know, civil unrest. Pag nag-utom na hula yung mga tao dyan, mga, especially those that are considered, you know, uh, yung mga below the uh, middle income group. Eh, karamihan po yan, eh magbabalak na po ng ibang hindi maganda po yan. Pero dito sa atin sa Pilipinas po, hanggat maaari po, hindi po natin nakikita po yan. At nakita nyo nga po, kahit nakuto yung itong mga jeep na driver natin na hindi pa nakakuha ng ilang ayuda, eh, imbes na mag-isip sila ng hindi maganda, eh, talagang gumawa na sila para, para mamalimu sa kalsada. Although it's not good, you know. Hindi magandang tignan po sa atin yun. But you know, they are doing things just for the survival of their family. Yung po ang importante dito that we all survive. So, ang sabihan nga nila, pagka nag-survive tayo, panalo na po tayo. And hopefully, uh, they can develop the cure of the vaccine so that everything will be going back to normal. But uh, hanggang wala pa po, yun lang po lagi yung pinapaalala, we should really be you know, supportive to one another and for the businesses for them to adapt and for them to also... Kasi eh, sa akin po, eh, ang pinapakiusap nga dito sa mga malaking negosyo, yun naman po mga executive ninyo na napakalalaki po ng mga sweldo, eh, pwede nyo naman ang pakiusapan natin yan, na for them to take a pay cut para naman itong pay cut na to ma-distribute natin doon sa mga empleyado po natin na nangangailangan po talaga. So ito naman mga executive natin to eh, I'm, May mga ipon na po yan, uh, may mga bahay na po yan, may mga ano po yan. Pero karamihan po na ating mga trabahador, eh yan po ay eh, isang kahig, isang tuka. Pag hindi mo nagtrabaho ng isang araw yan, eh hindi nila alam kung sa unang pag nga kinabukasan. Kaya yun po ang akin pinakikikusap din, especially through the PIMA, if, you know, your executives can, you know, uh, it's a little sacrifice but it will go a long way. Kaya Apo. kami... Amin pong ano, ilang ba na po na sweldo namin sa kongreso, eh doon din dinonate na po namin. Uh, sa pinakikusap po ni Spiegel, dahil po naman po ay tumugon sa pakikusap po niya. So sana po, itong ating po mga malalaking negosyante, 
na marami ho silang mga executives na lalaki po ng mga sweldo. Eh, I'm sure naman they can afford to, even for a few months to cut their salaries by let's say 50% or more. Para naman yung savings sa yun, it can be uh, filtered down to the lowly workers na talagang pong impacted. Uh, oh, Mar yeah. Maraming salamat po ulit. At uh, kukuha po tayo ng reaction. We're going to hear the comments and the reaction of one of our past presidents from FEMAP. He's going to talk about the role of HR in public and private sector in terms of talent management and retention, maybe even in salary and compensation. E.D. Arthur Luis Turok Florentine, Executive Director of the Civil Service Institute. Turok, are you, are you ready? I'm sorry there was uh, a technical glitch in sharing my uh, my slide but anyway um oh, maraming maraming request as a congressman sa PIMAP, sa HR yeah i'll be uh, uh, reacting in terms of the roles of hr in the time of covid but before uh, reacting, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Kayton for a very, very comprehensive uh, presentation and very insightful presentation of data in relation to COVID. According to him, uh, our situation is uh, improving. The uh, transmission rate is declining and uh, it is even now less than one. Uh, doubling time is increasing and is currently at 30 to 35 days. Uh, recovery rate is going higher. Death rate is declining. While uh, active cases uh, are now lower than the infected number of cases. Um, the question is, we were, uh, as Dr. Kato mentioned that uh, we, have, we were able to flatten our curve but we were able to do so because of an intervention. And I think the intervention here is the ECQ. And therefore, uh, if we will lift the ECQ, then what might happen to the, to the uh, curves later on? Before going to the uh, role of HR, I would like to uh, present some additional data. And uh, I would like to, to point out here that there are three types of countries with respect to uh, COVID. Um, the pink one, uh, the USA, Spain, Russia, UK, and Italy, uh, they are the most uh, affected. And uh, as we can see here, USA is the highest with 1.4 uh, uh, total infections, total death is 80,000. Compare this with the Philippines of 11,000, and only 726 deaths. Uh, but there are differences in population. So we also have part of our data here, uh, the, the indicators uh, per million population. And if we can see uh, for USA, it's 28,000, while for Philippines, it's only 1,489. On the other hand, there is also um, a set of countries below here, the green ones, that are even much lower than the Philippines. And I think uh, some of them, like for example, South Korea and Taiwan, they were able to uh, contain the, the, the virus, the infections, even without going into a community quarantine. So question is, what were they able to do? Perhaps we can uh, benchmark with them later on so that we will know what they did. But uh, what, the, the, what the figures here are also telling us is that if we were not able to flatten or uh, reduce you know, the, the effect of COVID-19, then we would have, we would have uh, incurred much more infections and dates like the ones uh, in US and 
Europe. So given that uh, we are currently uh, affected by COVID-19 and uh, because of this uh, pandemic, uh, we are into social distancing, com um, communication and travel is affected because we have the uh, ECQ or uh, enhanced uh, community quarantine. Given this, uh, it has uh, impacted us and uh, really plunged us into the digital world. I think uh, many of you will agree that there are so many uh, digital applications, uh, meeting, meeting rooms, social media, collaborative uh, applications that before we were not paying attention to. They have been here for quite some time, but uh, many of us have not been using these uh, digital applications because we felt more comfortable uh, using the face-to-face -face, um, uh, approach rather than the digital approach. But now because of necessity, uh, many of us are using the digital applications. Like for example, we are now uh, attending this workshop uh, uh, virtually. Now the social distancing and the digital world also affected the workplace. So as part of the new normal, the HR now has to focus more also on total wellness or wellness and health uh, because we need to balance between productivity and keeping our people safe. So what is, what is part of wellness? Part of that is making sure that uh, we are able to assess the risks of the, uh, of the workplace, of the processes that we are involved in. Are there face-to-face -face transactions? We also need to assess our employees who are, who are at high risk, who have uh, comorbidities, comorbidities or um, uh, immunocompromised conditions uh, so that we'll be able to you know, provide uh, new policies and guidelines that will um, you know, help uh, uh, take care of our employees. Aside from that, uh, we can go into alternative work arrangements. And later on, I'll, I'll discuss more in detail the alternative work arrangements. And also, uh, we can go learning on the go, uh, meaning that uh, we don't have to now meet face-to-face -face in tra uh, classroom training so that we can continually learn. Um, we need to continually learn because we are now shifting uh, the way we are doing things. No, we, we already have a new normal and uh, we need to be able to adapt and uh, uh, transition to this new normal. Now, with respect to the alternative work arrangements, uh, some of the work arrangements that we can consider will be work from home. But we, we need to also assess the kind of uh, the nature of work, no? which can be which, which uh, is conducive for work from home. But aside from that, we can also think in terms of skeletal workforce so that we can provide the, the basic service uh, that, that our organizations are supposed to, to um, deliver. And we can also think in terms of staggered hours. Staggered hours can be flexi time, it can be rotation, shifting, or, or even uh, uh, flexi time, okay? So uh, we, we are doing this so that uh, we can minimize the number of employees within the workplace so that we can uh, continue social distancing. And we can also think in terms of a work day, work week. Now, all of these uh, alternative work arrangements can be uh, supported also by the use of digital applications, which means that we need to uh, develop our competencies in making the best and most use of digital so that we don't have to go into face-to-face -face transactions. But aside from the alternative work arrangements, we also need to look into other wellness uh, uh, applications in the workplace, like for example, using protective gears, uh, face masks, uh, making sure that uh, uh, certain areas are, 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 uh, are, are 
secured like for example we cannot we cannot cram everybody into the elevator or into small areas so that uh, we have to be conscious about this but what is uh, most important is that as we do this um, uh, work and as we as we try to to and ensure that everybody is able to contribute to the productivity we need to also balance you no know, productivity with respect to uh, health and the uh, and the uh, implications of covid-19 so uh, what is important is uh, it's we if if ever the ecq is lifted the risk will still be there and as hr uh, we will need to uh, we will need to recommend interventions you know, that will that will help um, that that will help um, uh, address the the risk of covid-19 or transmissions in the workplace so that's my reaction thank you very much uh to rock mr to rock florentine for your very insightful uh comments i would uh, like to open the floor maybe for a few minutes on some questions uh there's one question for our speaker professor kayton uh the question is how many given the limited resources of the government or limited resources can you please comment on massive testing? How many should be tested? Okay, so <clears throat> there are a lot of numbers floating around in the academic circles. Ilan yung uh, suggested the DOH is saying eight thousand, which is a pretty good number. But the some of the experts in the UP COVID nineteen uh, pandemic response team is saying maybe nine thousand would be good. 9,000 to 10,000. The 8,000 is a good starting point, but uh, DOH does need some help in the implementation of that 8,000 tests per day. And I've heard some talks in some circles within the ITF, they are, which are relatively more aggressive than the 8,000, like they're thinking maybe 100,000 tests per day, but that is just a little bit too aggressive in terms of the resources of the country. Uh, but yeah, the 8,000 is a good number, 9,000 if it would be better per day so that we can really have a true prevalence uh, scan of the country. Um, but even in this case, we see that DOH needs a lot of help to reaching that 8,000 tests per day. They just recently achieved 8,000 tests per day, but it's not relatively consistent. They sometimes drop a little bit and on the average, they are able to really handle about 5,000 tests a day. And if you, and we see that, well, every day they're able to increase their testing capacity on the average by 100 tests a day. So in that case, if they want 8,000, without changing any of their trends, they might need a month more to achieve the 8,000 consistently. Consistently is the key here, not just uh, 8,000 on one day. It should be consistently at least 8,000. And we see that DOH needs a lot of help in this one. So there is still a need to expand the testing infrastructure, manpower, and policies. Thank you. Another question for Professor Caton is uh, about the reliability of data that you're using. I know you discussed that earlier. Yes. Uh, but uh, there, were, there, were, there was even a comment right from the COVID, UP COVID-19 response team about certain cases that were being reported as being uh, erroneous or something like that. So Yes, yes. Yeah. Now, uh, we see that DOH needs a lot of help in terms of their handling of the data. We've been sending comments to them about these changes through certain networks within the DOH and within their private data handling partners, but it really just takes them a little while to respond to our changes. Uh, and there is still that natural delay in the data because of the process, the verification process of DOH, which in our opinion is really just in terms of them having to need more help into the processing of the data and the validating of the data, because there have been some glaring, uh, there have been some glaring, uh, uh, 
what do I call it? Glaring uh, mistakes with the data. Like for example, there's a delay between the LGU and the DOH data values. One case was in Laguna where there are relatively large differences in terms of recoveries and deaths. And again, this is just with DOH one taking a lag time in terms of processing. And two, what we have seen is there might be a difference in how an LGU defines their cases and versus DOH defines a case because in the DOH data drop, they say region or province or city of residence. And it might be different with regards to how LGUs process data in terms of them occurrence if it happens within their province. So there might be these conflicts and things. So this, this way to find a unifying uh, description on how the data should be handled it's also something that we I, we believe DOH needs a lot of help and UUP COVID-19 extends itself, but then again, they have been uh, relatively uh, more invested within the resources that they have rather than um, uh, uh, receive, uh, ex, uh, rather than uh, looking at us as a helping hand in terms of this, as a helping partner. Thank you. Uh, we don't have that much time, so I'm going to be closing the webinar by uh, briefly summarizing the context of what we've been talking about. And largely, as communities move toward recovery, as I mentioned earlier, policymakers face difficult questions about how and when to relax intervention and how to weigh the economic cost of prolonged mitigation measures against the risk of a second wave of the virus. So uh, in deciding when to implement and lift interventions, whether to move from ECQ to GCQ or not, evidence-based quality data is important. And that is why we're having this session. Further, I would like to add that policymakers should consider how well the policies and intervention that they will promulgate the AIDS uh, and the social amelioration programs, how well it achieve its intended goal, whether what are the other unintended consequences? What can result and how easy or costly the policy is to implement and enforce and how different populations might be disproportionately affected. As was mentioned, we need to adapt and transition to this new normal and to this new economy. We need to recognize to be more adept to the digital world, we need to reskill and upskill to respond to the new normal. Foremost is to put the safety of our people first. Again, I would like to thank everyone for their active participation and involvement. We hope that this session was helpful. For more webinars, do not forget to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and other social media accounts. Again, a big thank you to our guests Professor Peter Julian Caton, Mr. Robert Dan Roses, 2012 Pima Past President Arthur Luis Florentin, and the Honorable Enrico Eric Pineda. To our IR committee members and the whole Pima community, maraming salamat po and stay safe, everyone. Management Association of the Philippines.
People Management Association of the Philippines.